Hey, it's Mike here, and today, magic mushrooms, or more appropriately, psilocybin and its effects. We are going to look throughout the literature and ask, is this healthy, is this not healthy, is this safe, is this risky, and so on. And a lot of the effects have to do with the brain, because of course that's where the magic happens. And just recently, a bunch of research has come out between like 2020 and 2021 on these topics, especially around depression with some mind blowing results. So I learned a lot researching this video. I think you will learn at least something. This is gonna more or less be a little sequel to my cannabis video, which more people than I thought ended up watching. And so we're just gonna dive into the literature, look at over a dozen studies. Let's go. All right, let's back up and take a quick glimpse into history. It appears that several cultures throughout the world have been consuming these types of mushrooms. We have all the way from Australia and North Africa to Central America. It appears that it was at least part of their culture to some degree unknown. And while this doesn't appear to have that much scientific backing, a fun little historical tidbit is that mushroom shamans in Northern Europe and Asia may or may not have been the blueprint for Santa Claus, at least his outfit. Look at that, look at that. You now we got the red kind of cap stuff going on. You know, I could see, kind of jolly. But fast forwarding a lot in the last few decades, the US decided to make it a schedule one drug. So a very forbidden substance. However, we now have a trend of cities decriminalizing psilocybin. Now, there's about four or so in the US. Now, before we get into mechanisms of how this works and all the amazing studies around it, I think it's important to just hit on safety real quick in the beginning, and we're actually gonna cover it more later, but we just have to quickly compare the danger of magic mushrooms to other recreational drugs, and thankfully, studies have done that. In 2016, there was a global drug survey of 12,000 people, The Guardian covered it, and they say that of people who reported taking psilocybin just 0.2% of them said they needed emergency medical treatment, a rate at least five times lower than that of MDMA, the active ingredient in ecstasy, LSD, and cocaine. I would add that a quick look at this chart also reveals that it was six to seven times safer than alcohol consumption in terms of the metric of emergency room visits, <laughs> worth noting. And I wanted to mention this early on because a lot of people who view it as completely an acceptable amount of risk to consume alcohol are probably really afraid of mushrooms and what they might do, but looking to data like this, I think we can agree that that is not necessarily rational, maybe it's more cultural. Anyway, we're gonna get into safety and risk of overdose and on and on in addiction later on in the video, but I just wanna get into how this works because it's pretty interesting. Oh, this whole time my leaves were off center. <sighs> anyway, you probably already know that psilocybin is the active ingredient. You might even know that it has something to do with serotonin. It gets a little more complicated because what happens is the psilocybin, as you consume it, your liver actually cleaves off the little X there that chopping is called phosphorylation, and the result is psilocin, which is the actual active ingredient. And now look at that right next to serotonin. Not exactly the same, but quite remarkably similar. That psilocin then has a high affinity for certain serotonin receptors known as 5-HT2A, and then it can have a bunch of psychedelic effects from there. Now how that alters consciousness and affects the brain and where that effect occurs is a little bit more open to debate, but there's one area of the brain that I think is particularly interesting here, and that is the clostrum. It's right there on the brain. Now you know where it is. And from this paper, quote, the clostrum is a subcortical nucleus that highly expresses 5-HT2A receptors. So it makes sense that psilocybin more or less targets that. This 2021 paper described it as, quote, one of the least understood anatomical structures within the cerebral hemispheres of the brain. It is also sometimes described as the wall of the brain. And as you can see here in figure two, it connects a lot of the sensory parts of the brain to the more processing parts of the brain. And from the Journal of Neurology, quote, this remarkable connectivity led to the proposal that the claustrum may be a nodal structure for conscious perceptual experience. So back to this study, which actually took 15 people, mushroomed them up and put them in an MRI and found that their claustrum activity went down. Was that opening the wall of the brain? I don't know, you can decide for yourself, but let's get to the actual results of the study, starting with depression, because we just got to hit that sooner than later. We all know that depression is horrible. It can be lethal. It's very dangerous. And frankly, a huge motivator for me doing this video was how shocked I was by the depression research. And thankfully, the US government actually started allowing some official 
psilocybin research in the depression area a few years back. Thankfully, that's led to a lot of new research, including this randomized control trial done at Johns Hopkins University, and it was published in JAMA. And they essentially took people who had severe depression, often very long-term depression, and they gave them a single high dose of magic mushroom psilocybin, and then they measured the effects. And yes, it was in a safe environment with a trained supervisor, but the results were, get this, four weeks out, the majority of people were in remission from severe depression. You know, major depressive episodes, to be specific. Now, it's one thing to just read that conclusion of the study, which in itself is amazing. It's another one to hear a bit of a description of what was going on, and that brings me to the podcast Science Versus, which had a good episode on this topic. They interviewed one of the authors, Alan Davis, and here's what he had to say. I just started to, to cry. <laughs> I think that, that the tears came because I realized that what was happening was so much more profound than the study. But the change that people were having in their lives, the experience of, of some of them having, you know, it been decades since they last felt joy or connection or love in their life. That is insane, and frankly, everybody needs to know about this, but it doesn't end there. We have another recent randomized control trial from the New England Journal of Medicine. They took psilocybin and they put it up against the common antidepression drugs, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and the results were that there was no difference in how effective they were, meaning the mushrooms were as effective at six weeks out as a pharmaceutical and it seems to be kind of downplayed there like oh it wasn't better than like this extremely popular antidepressant which has other side effects like hey that's a huge accomplishment and then wait here it says that the psilocybin did better in secondary effects well one of those secondary effects happened to be remission from depression, having a score below a certain threshold. Yes, remission occurred in 57% of psilocybin and 28% of SSRI participants. That's a 28 point difference. However, we do see that wide confidence interval. So that difference isn't really statistically meaningful. However, when you couple that with the previous study and you're getting the majority of people going into remission on psilocybin, like a larger study could expose a massive gap in curing depression of 20 or 30 points between SSRIs and psilocybin. So pretty amazing. I also want to mention from the study, looking at this chart, in this case, it was two doses, three weeks apart for psilocybin. But again, SSRIs, you're having to take, I believe, multiple times a day, every day. So that is seriously worth mentioning. Another one, a huge important depression related topic is to this randomized control trial, cancer related depression. And the results are once again, amazing. When looking at reports from both doctors and patients, we saw improvements in depressed mood and anxiety along with increase in quality of life, life meaning and optimism and decrease in death anxiety. Get this, at six month follow-up, these changes were sustained with about 80% of participants continuing to show clinically significant decreases in depressed mood and anxiety. To see sustained results like that is pretty great. And I also want to mention this University of Maryland study that, you know, says you might not actually have to trip out in order to have the positive effects here. So people who don't want to be doing that in the future, that could be fine tuned as well, perhaps, and it could benefit everybody there. Now you might be curious about what people's experience might actually be like when they're improving depression. And thankfully, Alan Davis recounted some of them on Science Versus. And one of them that he mentioned stuck out to me, which I thought was pretty awesome. And that was that there was a dude who was depressed. He had severe anxiety about going to work. But then during his trip, he imagined that he was a dragon dragon that went to work and ate his co-workers, which sounds kind of creepy. It doesn't have to be creepy. And then uh, he felt better about work. Thankfully, we have actual footage of the guy at work before inside of his head during his trip and then at work after. Here he is. Oh my God, Cindy, my manager is over at the water cooler. She wants that report stat. I'm so screwed. I need to make a bunch of copies. Oh my God, bitch, I'm a dragon. I just melted Cindy and then ate her and she tasted great. Oh, hey, Cindy. How's it going? Good to see you. 
And one aspect of such therapy might have to do with the amygdala, which is quite interesting. A lot of other therapies like EMDR for PTSD center around making you less stressed out as you're recalling traumatic events. And so in the case of psilocybin, it appears that it's actually down-regulating your amygdala as well. And from this study, quote, the main subcortical limbic brain regions implicated in depression are the amygdala, among others. So you could call it not just the fear center or the fight or flight center, but also a little bit of the depression center, one of the centers. And as this study mentions, this effect seems to last about a week and fades by about a month. So it doesn't last forever, but it's significant. So what could have been happening with that dragon situation was not only was he going to work in his mind in a non-stressed out way, but then over the next week, he might've just been less stressed out in general. Maybe it's a part of the brain like the amygdala. Maybe there's something more all-encompassing happening, and there was a good analogy in that Science Versus podcast by Dr. Albert Garcia Romeu. Here he is. Kind of like a, a snow globe. Uh, you know, you shake the snow globe and you get um, all this kind of movement, and then eventually it settles back down into maybe a new pattern. No, so it's possible that in long-term depression, your brain sort of becomes hardwired to be depressed day after day, in and out, and then just some sort of cataclysmic event, but hopefully not as dangerous as a cataclysmic event, shakes things up, and then there's just a good chance that they're gonna land in a better configuration than they were because they were in a horrible configuration, unfortunately. This theory is somewhat backed by how we have evidence that psilocybin regrows neural connections that could have been lost during depression. Unfortunately, this is a mouse study, which I'm not super excited about for many reasons, but author Alex Kwan of Yale described the study, quote, we not only saw a 10% increase in the number of neuronal connections, but also they were on average about 10% larger, so the connections were stronger as well, and they appeared to still last a month out. Now, before we get into our final safety points, I wanna just rapid fire a few cool side effects that are happening here. One is from this study, there appears to be an anti-inflammatory effect of just taking these mushrooms in general, which is pretty cool and common for other mushrooms. And then in terms of smoking, we're going to talk about addiction in a second, but from this study, yeah, quote, at long-term follow-up, nine participants or 60% were confirmed as smoking abstinence. So not a huge study, but the majority were able to quit smoking, which is awesome. And finally, just a fun one, they found that at a 12-month follow-up, 86% of people rated their psilocybin experience among the five most personally meaningful and spiritual spiritually significant experiences of their lives. The only more common spiritual experience listed was consuming the Sprite at McDonald's. <laughs> I'm kidding, but let's get into those risks. One is there's a fear of people perhaps having a psychotic a break or increasing risk of mental illness by taking psilocybin. And yeah, Business Insider could kind of freak somebody out about that, mentioning things like brain damage and, and possibly triggering psychotic episodes. But frankly, those are just opinions and we have to look to the research. And thankfully we have a massive study of 130,000 people here. It looked at various hallucinogenic including psilocybin, and no, it did not appear that psilocybin was associated with an increase in mental illness. In fact, as the study says, quote, in several cases, psychedelic use was associated with a lower rate of mental health problems, which absolutely makes sense after what we know about depression. You know, well, people should consult their doctor and take into account mental health and so on, and it's not like nothing bad is ever happening in this area, just the data show that it's not as scary as people are making it out to be. Anyway, now let's move on to the risk of overdose and addiction. And yeah, you can take a high dose and have various negative effects, but overdose does not appear to be a rational concern for people dying, for example. As this study mentions, a tolerance is built quite quickly, and because of this, it might take a few days until you can even have an effect again, so it'd be really hard to be addicted to this. So the biggest dangers here are probably just having impaired senses, getting yourself into dangerous situations that way, so it should be done in a safe environment, goes without saying. And then also just picking the wrong mushrooms and eating a poisonous mushroom is, is perhaps one of the largest dangers. And again, it was the lowest on that list of recreational drugs for emergency room visits. And I do wanna mention though, that people should of course consult their doctors about medication that they are taking. There can be some cross reactivity with various antidepressants and things. So from this study, various antidepressants are likely benign, but those monoamine oxidase inhibitors could be particularly dangerous here. 
And I will say there are random like mushroom clinics that don't take people on SSRIs. So that's just worth mentioning. This should be thought about. And the concern here is serotonin toxicity. And if you wanna learn more about that, I will of course link this study below and of course everything else that I've mentioned. In the end, well, mushrooms have been stigmatized and illegal for decades, at least here. It's pretty clear that there's growing evidence that they have a incredibly valuable use in the realm of depression. And who knows, we need to do more studies on more things. But we're getting multiple randomized control trials in credible journals by credible universities showing, you know, that perhaps the majority of people that try this could be in remission from depression. And if that is the case, the amount of lives saved, the amount of lives completely turned around would be countless. And when you combine that with how safe this is, especially compared to alcohol, how unlikely it is for people to be addicted, it's pretty clear that this needs to be completely reevaluated as a schedule one substance. And finally, mushrooms are vegan. Uh, that's all I need to say. Anyway, let me know down below what you think about all this research. And if there's anything really cool that I missed, absolutely share below. And unfortunately, this video is pretty much guaranteed to get demonetized or mostly demonetized. So of course you could help me out on my Patreon, which I will link below, patreon.com slash MikeTheVegan. And that's it for today. Feel free to like, subscribe. Thanks for watching.